So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to call the January 20th, 2020 Committee of the Whole meeting to order at 6 p.m. and acknowledge that we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. Item two, uh, I would like to ask for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. And I'll ask the question. All in favor? Unanimous. Item three, uh, Committee of the Whole, December 2nd, 2019 minutes. I'd ask uh, for a motion to adopt the minutes of the December 2nd, 2019 Committee of the Whole meeting. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? Unanim unanimous. Do I have to press this button? I guess I should have. Uh, no, there's no recording. Oh, okay. uh, sorry. Maybe turn it off and then turn it back on and see if the camera. No? There we go. Okay. Oh, now it's working now. Not sure why it froze before. It's looking at me, that's why. <laughs> and at this uh, point in time in the meeting, I'd, uh, it's, for, it's for public participation. I would like to invite the uh, public to take this opportunity to comment on tonight's agenda items and advise that uh, any additional opportunities, and I'd like to advise that any additional opportunities will be provided at each agenda item, as well as during the final public participation at the end of the meeting. I'd just like to advise you that council cannot receive comments on matters where a public hearing has been held until the bylaw regarding the matter has been adopted. 20 minutes will be allowed uh, for, public uh, for the public participation period. And just a quick reminder to the public that when you come forward, if you could state your name and address for the record. Any takers? This, like that? Oh, good. Uh, I suppose you all know I'm John English. <laughs> I live at 401 Proctor Place. Um, sure. That's fine. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, as you know, my name is John English. I live at 401 Proctor Place. Um, <clears throat> my, I'm here tonight to report that my neighbours and I are growing increasingly concerned about the uh, fact that actually we have not shared our views um, with the, the way development is going in Royal Bay with you, uh, <clears throat> and both in general and, and on specific developments. <clears throat> Um, that have been brought forward to the mayor and council. And um, we've, we're feeling concerned about this because we're seeing development and, and the developers continuing to push forward with their plans and, and lobbying you. And, and, and uh, we would like you to know what our views are too. So um, <clears throat> on November 4th uh, last year, as you know, um, the district property group withdrew their development plans uh, for discussion at the Committee of the Whole uh, so that they could consult further with the community. Uh, we want you to know that uh, despite numerous follow-up attempts on our part, uh, the community has been unable to uh, um, find a, a, or get a commitment from the developer on a time, date and place to uh, uh, conduct those further consultations. So for two and a half months, um, we've been really stymied in our efforts to 
uh, communicate our views on the property development planned at 360 Latoria. And then we saw on the 16th of December, the Gablecraft um, home submitted development plans to, to you uh, as the mayor and council for South Latoria. And uh, they lobbied for flexibility <coughs> in, um, that uh, uh, with respect to the OCP existing bylaws and zoning. They stated that what they wanted to do was to build on their success uh, in developing the lands in North uh, Latoria, referring to open houses they've held with the community. Uh, there was no mention, uh, to, as far as we know, uh, there was no mention from them to you of the uh, fact that actually 80 plus uh, <coughs> Royal Bay homeowners met with the representatives of Gablecraft Homes two days before, and, and we attempted to explain why uh, people in the community are upset with uh, their behavior as a developer in North Latoria and uh, why Gablecraft Homes should uh, recognize that they have a responsibility to fix um, uh, some of the problems that we believe they're, they're a party to. Our community feels that it's very important for you, the mayor, and for council to understand our views and uh, on the development that is occurring in Royal Bay. We therefore wish to respectfully submit uh, two written submissions today, as well as, as offer some uh, general comments on the development that is occurring um, generally. And uh, so with that, uh, Shane, could you uh, hand out the, these are our uh, two reports. One one is on uh, uh, South. Sorry, who should I give them to you? Individually? <laughs> One's on South Latoria, and the other report is is on um, 360 Latoria. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, we we want to sh on December 16th, the uh, developer's representative uh, stressed to you folks that uh, residential development always precedes commercial. So we want to let you know that we did some checking into that. And uh, we've been advised that that absolutely is not the case. As there are numerous examples where commercial development is either done concurrently with residential development and or it's done in advance. And, and there are reasons for that. that the <clears throat> a nearby example of development that's been done concurrently and very successfully is the mixed commercial and residential development uh, of Belmont Market in the city of Langford. And um, that was done um, um, uh, concurrently. Uh, we have other examples that have been given to us about uh, areas that are done in the new greenfield areas where often the commercial area is done first to be an attraction. And then what is done is, is that there's uh, uh, residential and higher density residential uh, development built either over the stores or around the stores, just like at Belmont Market, where you see the um, higher buildings going up, they're four or five stories. Uh, we've been informed that, <clears throat> in fact, it's risky for municipal governments to permit residential development to, to occur first. There's a number of problems with, or risks with that, by allowing the more lucrative high density residential development to be done first, municipal governments run the risk that the developer might drag their feet and the planned commercial development will either not be done uh, for an extended period of time or never done as has been planned in the OCP. And that leaves then a higher concentration of residences uh, without the services that were envisioned and that you envisioned. We, we strongly urge the mayor and council <coughs> to also require that a road system first be planned and approved that clearly demonstrates how it will not only resolve uh, current traffic issues in the community, but also how it will facilitate achieving the new community-driven OCP vision for the Seaside Village, being a world becoming a world-class destination and a citywide and regional destination for shopping, dining, and, and recreation. And uh, <clears throat> we also, believe that the, that the road system needs to be built in mind with the view that the uh, Commons Commercial Centre is going to uh, need to be able to handle traffic in and out and it's and both in the seaside communities, the center of seaside village is going to be the same too. If 
if we expect people to come to those places, we're going to have to make it easy for them. And I can't see somebody packing, you know, three kids on a bicycle and, and going to uh, a shop uh, down the hill and then, then pedal back up Machosen Hill with carrots and stuff falling out of their hamper. So, um, so I think what we would do is we would encourage the council um, and the mayor to, to, to make sure that that the developers are, are giving a good solid plan for how the um, the traffic is going to be managed because we, we didn't see that at, at last um, uh, week's meeting of mayor and council uh, a, a report was presented to you and and don't mean to um, be hard on people but uh, we didn't see anything in that report at all that was considering the commercial development in the seaside village or in the commons area and if there's going to be a lot of traffic there, if you look at, at, at these developments and these centers, we need to plan for that. And, and the idea of, of counting the number of doors in a community and then planning traffic on that and ignoring the business aspects that are, that are central to the OCP vision for the Seaside community and for the common center or commercial center is of great concern. <clears throat> um, Approving higher density than was planned uh, in the OCP without knowing what kind of road system will be required to just support the existing OCP vision could lead to the failure of that vision. So uh, the people in Royal Bay um, were, uh, were not anti-development people and were not opposed to higher density residential development. We are in the process of establishing a Royal Bay Homeowners Association our wish is to work collaboratively with the city and with the developers to help see the Royal Bay development done in a responsible and respectful manner, in a manner which will enable the city to realize the vision for Royal Bay and for the community-driven uh, OCP for the Commons as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. English. Does uh, anyone in council have any questions? Mr. Earl, is it uh, best for us to, to uh, ask staff to, to review this and, and get back to council on this? The uh, written report, sorry. So I think it's entirely appropriate for that material to be forwarded to the planning and development team who are involved in uh, the applications that are coming before council with respect to Royal Bay. Thank you. Do we need a motion for that or we, do you just do that right? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Going once, going twice. Okay, we'll go on to uh, the next item, uh, item five. Okay, item 5.1, Road Improvement, Veterans Memorial Parkway and Ellendale Road. I'd like to invite uh, Brent Molnar, uh, Director of Engineering and Development Services, to the podium to introduce the item. Good evening, committee. Now, tonight we're here to talk about Veterans Memorial Parkway and Allendale Road in support of agreements and road works that are potentially coming forward. Just to start off, there are a correction that I'd like to make in the report. When I've referenced the cross section for Wildcat, it says that the cross section above, that should be addressed as the cross section below in the, in the report, as well as there's a reference for Wildcat Lane, which should be equal to Wildcat Trail. So, in regards to the works that we're here to talk about tonight, can you go next? Just 
push the arrow. Um, we're going to start our discussions about an agreement that was made with the Council of the Day in 2001 and the developers of the land. In 2001, the Ministry of Transportation and Highways, represented by the BCTFA, which is the Transportation and Finance Authority, were to acquire lands in partnership with the City of Colwood and the developers and the owners of the lands. The lands in question were owned by Ridley Brothers and the three people involved in, the, uh, involved in the equation, the BCTFA, the City of Colwood, and the developers entered into an agreement. That is referenced in your report as the agreement. That agreement is specific to four areas of land that have been subdivided in fourth, and these portions of land are the subject of our further discussion tonight. So when in your report I refer to the agreement, these are the lands that are subject to the agreement. Wildcat Lane is on the east side of Veterans Memorial Parkway, um, Allendale stretches both east and west across Veterans Memorial Parkway, and uh, Veterans Park Memorial Parkway runs through the middle of the lands. Through our discussions on the January 13th uh, meeting where we discussed the traffic for South Colwood, portions of those reviews talked about the entire network for South Colwood as it was balanced against not just the residential doors, but the doors which included the commercial entities in the Royal Bay and Royal Beach lands, and how that would translate throughout the whole development of the lands and the areas in the South Colwood area all the way up to Veterans Memorial Parkway. This report and this proposal and the agreement actually encumbers some of those lands that were talked about at that January 13th meeting, and then add further information to that meeting. Up at the top portion of your screen, you'll see Souk Road, and just south of that on your image is a red dot. That red dot signifies the intersection of Allendale Road and Veterans Memorial Parkway, and then a dashed line translates to the west from that red dot, from that red dot, sorry, from the east from that red dot, showing a potential future collector roadway that stretches between Wishart Road and Veterans Memorial Parkway. So if we look at the information that was presented to Council, on January 13th. This builds on that information about the traffic and the network that's to be generated in South Colwood and this speci specifically is based on the, the agreement that was signed in 2001. The lands that are subject to development are Ridley Brothers own land that are on the subject a subject of determined negotiation with Omnicron. The Omnicron developer is here tonight, Peter Laughlin, if you have any questions relevant to that. But the agreement that we signed in 2001 translates to the lands. And the lands that are under development right now are both on the west side and east side of Veterans Memorial Parkway. And the agreement speaks to the fact that those properties that were previously noted in the agreement lands will not be subject to frontage works at the time of development, either through building permit, subdivision, rezoning, or other actions on the TAF on behalf of the city. Since 2001, that agreement has stood up until the date when the development is essentially happening, and then it's the obligation of the city at the time to fulfill the frontage obligations to the bylaw and to the most recent resolution of council, which is the transportation master plan, if so elected. So the lands in question here are shown as red X's. They surround both portions of Veterans Memorial Parkway. You can see the southern extent of those lands is bound by that roadway that you see, you see on the edge. The eastern extent is shown as a limit of construction which coincides with the limit of the negotiated, negotiated terms of the agreement and the western portion of the lands is the Allendale pieces as well that are currently under blasting and works that we um, experience on a daily basis. So speaking more about the agreement, the in 2001 dictated that the roadworks and the responsibilities for frontage improvements, which include the serviceability of the land, sewer water drain, and other infrastructure requirements relevant to the development of the land, should be constructed by the city at the time that facilitates the development of the land. As previously indicated, we've been able to reside on that agreement since 2001. However, the, develop, the development lands are now under option by Omnicron, um, and they have proposed an opening date for buildings and structures on the land to be around 2021, roughly a year plus away. Going into what the lands mean and what we're looking to subject the development too. They are presently all contained within the M2 zone. There's a portion of one of the portions of land that is a residentially assigned R1 zone. And in referencing the official community plan, they're also contained within what's called a mixed use employment center, which is a center that provides significant employment opportunities, supportive of employment generating uses, creative infill housing, such as live work and student housing, well collected and supportive of transit, and, or sorry, I should say well connected and supportive of transit and also that they support walking, cycling and including um, and improvements to the public realm and they could be characterized by green spaces. 
drilling from the official community plan into the land use bylaw and subject to the terms, terms of the present developer, Omicron. The lands will be realized under the M2 zone. There may be a slight chance for opportunity to come um, for council to consider rezoning of the lands as the development moves forward. But presently the lands are M2, which is a general industrial zone. And the zone allowable uses include gasoline service stations, coffee shops, gravel processing, retail sale, rental of automobiles, trucks, boats, fuel, etc. One dwelling units for a caretaker could include unenclosed storage, accessory buildings and structures, but may not include things that are considered offensive under the Health Act, refuse or garbage dumps, the burning of motor vehicles and other things for salvage purposes. So the city does expect to see development permit applications relevant to the development of the lands within the next two months. Um, the developer Omnicron has spoken about those doors and those businesses being available for operation midway through 2021. So the time for improvement um, as per the agreement would be considered today. The bylaw standing from 2001 relevant to the bylaw of, of today has not changed. However, Council in the meantime in 2014 considered the transportation master plan and resolved that that should be the standards for the city streets and infrastructure. However, the bylaw has languished behind. The city has received a class D estimate for the works that would be necessary to undertake it and that is being proposed as part of our financial considerations. The recommendations from committee to council are that as part of the upcoming budget process for expenditure in 2021, that we propose to draft a budget with funding options to design and construct complete with any necessary upgrades to storm drainage, sanitary extension and underground utilities the following. Upgrades to Veterans Memorial Parkway from Souk Road, which is the northern extent of the lands under the agreement, to the south extent of lands under the agreement, which is referenced by PID, which is Parcel Identification Number, to the standards of the Transportation Master Plan, and that upgrades to the western extent and full road construction of the eastern extent of Ellendale Road occur, west and east of the extent of the limits of the lands as defined by the agreement, to the standards of the Transportation Master Plan, and that Wildcat Trail, the full extent be developed to the standards of the Transportation Master Plan. Also that staff return to Council with draft amendments to the Development Cost Charge bylaw, which include the improvements necessary to provide the services and upgrade to Veterans Memorial Parkway from Souk Road through to Cairnday Road, which will tie into that larger infrastructure program uh, for South Colwood, and Allendale Road east of Veterans Memorial Parkway to the extent of the developing lands as captured under the agreement. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'd um, like to ask anyone from the public, uh, I'd like to give them this opportunity right now to uh, make any comments. Mr. President. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, perhaps we just don't understand, but it doesn't make any sense to us um, how the traffic is is being planned. We don't see a plan, and we'd like to see a plan, um, and uh, uh, very much. And and the reason, so, so for us, when we were looking at at the, the results of the discussion on January thirteenth, we were seeing doors. So we know that it, there's supposed to be hopefully a large grocery store going to be built in the commons area and and that's great and the, and and the kind of traffic flow that is going to be necessary to support that store as an example is going to be a heck of a lot different than it would be for somebody's residence or for uh, um, uh, a small business of, of uh, an insurance business for instance so what we'd like to understand as residents is that the traffic requirements to to make the, the Commons Commercial Center a success, and to and the traffic requirements to make the Seaside Village a success, as envisioned in the OCP, that there's a plan already in place and approved that can be built around by the developers. We don't see it ourselves. We see um, lineups. Uh, on Latoria now, and we recognize that's now, and 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 that's there should be change, but we'd like to see the plan first, and 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 
if there is a plan, then it would make sense to be able to allow the developers to go ahead and, and, and build out. But if there is no plan to handle that traffic, then we're going to cause a problem uh, for both the people that live in the community and we're also going to undermine the ability for the OCP to be realized uh, in its key vision of, of, of this area becoming um, a world-class destination and uh, a regional destination and a citywide destination. We all want it to be a success and, and, uh, and I know staff does too but our point is this is that you know we're not the experts but but we want to, to know that that there's a plan for the traffic system that's going to work for the whole community and we include in that the um, Commons Commercial Center and the Seaside Village and so we just don't understand it because I don't know how many doors the, the big grocery store would count for uh, compared to somebody's house but surely not the same Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Mr. English, I, I just want to clarify, you, you're talking about Royal Bay or are you talking about Allendale Pit, right? Which? I'm, I'm talking about Royal Bay. Okay. So we're, yeah, we're, we're addressing the Allendale Pit right now. The reason I, I, I raised it was um, in the discussion that was being presented, uh, it was said that it was referencing what was presented to you as the mayor and council on the 13th and and the discussion about doors uh, and being the way to count and plan for for traffic systems and we were just confused by that like we we, uh, we just uh, we didn't think there was a plan and then there may be a, a, a plan for doors all around Allendale but but the discussion was about the January 13th the discussion was about doors about and the traffic up veterans and 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 so 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 I understand but it, we're, I'm picking up on the January 13th discussion of doors and how the heck do you, like I don't know how many doors a supermarket has but but um, maybe they need 100 doors I don't know <laughs> there you go Not to talk about Royal Beach and Royal Bay in regards to the Allendale, um, but several of the questions raised by Mr. English could be identified and talked about so the council's aware and committee's aware in their recommendations moving forward to council. Everything that you see on this, excepting the light and signal that rider hedge stall, was recognized in the 2014 Transportation Master Plan, which is available. Um, certainly it can be made available on the web if it's not presently. Um, and every single intersection and every single roadworks has been noted in 2014 documentation, with the exception of the four-laning geometrics for Latoria. That is the only piece of the puzzle that wasn't identified in 2014. So referencing back to the Allendale works and how those were considered in 2014 by the Transportation and Master Plan, the intersection um, at this was considered, as a matter of fact, it came part of the 2001 consideration at the time of, of covenant signing with the Ridleys, was the fact that that intersection would need to be signalized in a later time and likely due to the development. It also spoke to the extension of Allendale Road and time through Wishart Road. The only relationship to the Royal Bay and Royal Beach is the fact that cumulated density, cumulated traffic all speak to that being a collector volume. Thank you very much, Brent. Any other uh, comments from the public? Okay, at this time, I'd like to uh, open the discussion up to, uh, to the committee. All right. Um, so I think I think it is really important uh, because this is, um, you know, the the slide that we were just looking at a moment ago is all of the transportation for uh, all of South Colwood uh, is is implicated by 
the decisions that are being made here today. So uh, I completely understand Mr. English speaking to the uh, recommendations for uh, the Allendale lands uh, very much affecting all of the other developments that are taking place in South Colwood. So uh, I, th I think it is really important. I do find uh, for myself there were um, aspects to the 2014 Transportation Master Plan uh, that I found um, not acceptable in in terms of I, I didn't feel that they met uh, the outcomes that they, we were looking for uh, and specifically uh, I know council has talked uh, since the transportation master plan was adopted that it it does really need to be updated as you know a lot has changed since 2014 and I think it's really critical that we build as needed. Um, this is a very uh, big comprehensive plan and when, what I think was one of the major downfalls of our transportation master plan was that it did not take into account um, the circumstances on the ground. It, it was a planning document uh, based on uh, making everything uh, equal uh, in, in Colwood, so if you live on a collector road, this is what a collector road would look like, but it didn't take into account the restrictions that um, do exist in a number of areas in order to achieve that. Um, so I'm just, uh, one of the recommendations um, includes upgrades to Veterans Memorial Parkway, and I'm afraid that the descriptor of where the limit of those upgrades would be uh, is a lot number that I don't know where that is. <laughs> it doesn't have a physical address that I can understand. So can you explain to me where it comes to? So that's beyond... Of course, we'll, we'll go back to the, to the other uh, slides we, so we can stitch together the slides relevant to the agreement of 2001. Okay. So the blue X's represent the land areas that were subject to, uh, to the agreement. The southern extent of the uh, eastern portion... Is, is just the more accurate way of referring to a property that can't be construed with another property. It's only single entity is why it's used in this legal context. Okay. Um, so I was having difficulty determining uh, if we were talking about widening Veterans Memorial Parkway along the entire length and uh, for me um, I believe that that's uh, ahead of its time at this point in time uh, and I would like to know uh, I, d I don't believe in, in my recollection I can't think of a single road that Colwood has built uh, on its own that, that we have fully funded um, so is, is there a a precedent for for us having to to do all the the entire cost of the roadway there was a couple of questions there one of them was based upon the extent of the works the obligation under the agreement just takes us to the south portion of the developing lands as considered in the agreement shown by that X where I drew that line across however if you're going to do a design exercise we know that the intersection of Cairndale is actually a, considered a low accident volume intersection but has a high degree of conflict at the zone. It is efficient to design and perhaps considering the development cost, par car cost charge program the improvement of that segment of roadway in concert. It's not critical and that's why the, um, the, the resolution number two 
is to consider that right through to Cairndale. But resolution in regards to commit um, recommendation number one deals explicitly with the southern and eastern limits of those land boundaries. It's just if, if committee felt that there was a benefit to doing a complete design out to, out to Cairndale, that this might be an opportune time. The second part of your question was, is there a time and opportunity for cost share? I believe I've paraphrased that correct. I think that time and opportunity was back in 2001. And the, the conditions of the covenant are very clear and very expressive and have been reviewed with the developer, with the owner of the land and the owner of the land solicitor as being clear and, con and being absolute. The requirements are that we, the Colwood, construct those improvements and Colwood and Colwood alone. The intersection works and the intersection works. There is a provision in the agreement that says that if the intersection upgrade is necessary, and it's necessary due to the development of the land specifically as assigned to the developer that they are responsible for portions of those upgrades of the intersections. At present, staff has no budget to go about preparing a cost estimate for the works or going into detailed design. All of that still needs to occur so that the lands can be opened without impediment or without delay in the servicing objectives. So in those servicing objectives, I guess I'm trying to determine um, what the best time is to do those improvements and given that we don't have a development proposal that anyone you know council certainly has not seen it public certainly has not seen it um, uh, I'm concerned that we're developing a roadway without knowing what that roadway is servicing uh, so I, I guess I'm looking to find what are our incremental options um, because I, I would like us to, of course, minimize the, the outlay at, at the outset and, and ensure that the, the roadway that does get built, fully recognizing that an agreement was made that Colwood would do that. Um, uh, but I want to realize that perhaps in stages that meets the needs of the lands and and is supportable through the tax base having to pay for it. I, I don't necessarily hear a question to specifically respond to, but I will respond to the key part of you're correct. We, at present, we don't have a development permit application. However, development permit application would not be vetted by council. The only portion of an application that would be coming forward to council and open to the public consultation is one that requires rezoning. Hence why I flip back to this map here. The general use of the land is enough to predicate the, the necessity of what style or type of road. The volume of traffic generated from these uses would predicate the sort of intersection geometrics that would be necessary to serve those lands. The developer has already engaged Watt Consulting and we've provided a. Uh, traffic impact assessment in terms of reference to walk consulting based on the allowable uses. Those minimum uses, which are the ones that are outlined in front of you, have indicated that it is highly likely that an intersection will be necessary. So drilling down to the minimum standards of improvement. It is for this committee to recommend to council or through staff to bring back varying layers of, of degrees. The minimum service levels are those that will be required to provide service and, and services and utilities to the lands. Then the road is what could be thinner on top of that in terms of ultimate standards to minimum standards. Since 2001, the cost of constructing a road works would have increased by 20, 30, 40 percent, generally between 2 and 8 percent per year. And we've seen accelerated growth over that in the last eight years as um, the ability to obtain labor is actually thinned on the South Island. So the cost of construction actually continues to escalate. At minimum, we could, we could consider the cost of construction to increase at the cost of living, roughly 2% per year. So since 2001, the cost of the value of this project has increased by 18 years value at 2%. Any further delay on the project may delay the ability to open the doors, which will have negative implications in terms of meeting the obligations of the covenant. However, anything we elect not to do today or committee elects not to do today that is expressed forward to council and left for another later day, what that does, as long as the minimum service levels are met, what that does is just maintain the agreement as being unsatisfied and maintain the obligation as being met of a future council. So um, just 
to follow up on that uh, with the zoning as it presently is, um, general industrial, uh, it, it's possible that, um, you know, I, I'm not looking to shortchange the development, but what I am looking for is to try to understand what, what we're servicing because general industrial doesn't really tell me very much about how many tr cars are coming, how many trucks are coming, how large they are, what their issues are. Um, and if development is other than industrial, rezoning will be required and with that rezoning would come additional needs for a different, a potentially different road infrastructure. As previously noted by committee, the transportation master plan allows for some consideration in terms of the road network. And I look at it as being well expressed in regards of the initiatives of transportation, but also expressed in terms of meeting the obligations that are vested here in front of you in the OCP and how the land is to be basically addressed through the mixed use employment center. Transportation master plan provides for biking connectivity, pedestrian connectivity, improvements to the boulevard, but also has a relatively standard uniform lane. It would be in working with the developer that we'd work to make sure that those lane and geometrics would fit the turning radiuses of vehicles, but that's the only complication that would be necessary to serving the lands in terms of road width and standards. It would roughly be the same. So on page three of your report, it says a VMP, um, council may elect to extend through to Latoria Road. Um, since we don't know exactly what is being proposed on the lands, and um, and we don't, you know, we we still there's many things that we still don't know yet about what will occur in other areas of South Colwood. I'm just not sure why uh, VMP would be, in fact, larger than the Trans Canada Highway right now. I can't speak to the considerations of Council in 2014, but I can speak to the fact that Veterans Memorial Parkway in that 2014 consideration was intended to take the travel volumes of four lanes of roadway. Now how Council, um, either working through staff or working as direct staff, chooses to make those lanes possible, lanes are necessary to accommodate BC Transit and accommodate other uses as well. Seeing a four lane roadway. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's four lanes open to the motoring public, but it could mean that the carriageway is open to all users of that roadway. Enabling it to be four lanes is what the transportation master plan shows, and that's been reinforced through all of the recent studies that the city has seen. And that cross-section in 2014 was considered wholly from Goldstream all the way through to Latoria Road as being a consistent profile. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I um, I have a number of thoughts and, and questions, and if I uh, get too long-winded and you want to shut me up and let somebody else have a turn, just uh, just jump in. Um, firstly, perhaps uh, I think I share a little bit of Mr. English's sort of confusion with traffic reports when they talk about doors. But but my understanding is that while it may talk about doors, it also takes into account other uses and projects their traffic requirements. So it, so I think we could provide some reassurance to Mr. English and his, and his uh, buddies that, that the traffic reports do address other issues besides just residential. So I, th I think that's probably perhaps not what we're here for tonight, but if any time we can head off people's concerns, it's probably worthwhile doing. Um, so I got a few sort of uh, thoughts here that I'm, uh, I'll go through in, in somewhat of order. At first, the DCC bylaw, and, and, and Brent, we see you uh, often on major files speaking to us, and they, so many of them seem to refer back to the DCC bylaw. And, and here tonight, as I think it's the first time I've seen a reference to, well, maybe we could do a partial upgrade of the DCC bylaw. Um, I'm just wondering, A, is partial beneficial over a full upgrade? Uh, 
is there more horsepower needed to get a DCC bylaw done expeditiously, which I think probably everybody at the table and within the city would, would pro, pro, how, how, how should we best address that to get her done? This project, based on the intention to open doors, I would say is of, is, is of relatively high priority in terms of funding mechanisms. Yes, DCC program is an option here. However, we may not have the six months that will be necessary to move from today in order to realize a DCC program through the ministry. If I lost six months in regards to working on this project, I don't believe that we'd actually make the time intent. We've been speaking with finance about different options. Um, and I think that it would take a minimum of six months to upgrade the DCC program to be a full, full and, and wholesome. Yes, there is the opportunity to swap projects that are completed for projects that are there, but that in itself would take two, two and a half months, hands drawn. So I do think that we will need to pull in resources to assist with it. It's a matter of timing and upgrades and, um, and timing and potential. So I think that um, this one should perhaps be looked at as only being latently funded through the DCC program and that we'd be given direction to do a wholesome update of that DCC program as we return back within the next month. Sorry, so you, so you are suggesting an interim upgrade for to the DCCs to cover this project and a, and a more complete one to follow, is that correct? The DCCs are one of the funding options available here. As indicated, I think that we're going to take months and I frankly believe that we need to be in design and procurement of, a de of design services relatively quickly in order to meet the time frame here. There's two options in regards to funding, which is on page six of seven of your report. One is to improve the DCC program, and the other one is for borrowing. The cost to borrow right now is low and maybe the best way to serve this project. I don't believe that we can spend money today and get it repaid back from the DCC program. Okay, so my sort of rough understanding of a DCC by law is that growth forces requirements for more infrastructure and the cost of that infrastructure spread amongst the growth so that everybody pays their fair share. But it doesn't sound like it's going to be there in time for this project. Hmm. Um, uh, next question is on the agreement. Uh, and I, of course, I've never not read it and I won't pretend to understand it in full, but, I, but it seems to me that it, I'm not sure, it's not clear to me whether it says the city shall not make the owners of those lands undertake all the necessary works or whether it says the the necessary works will be undertaken by the city when, when the owners of those lands require them. So it's obviously, it's, it's a two different thing. One is, yes, we have an obligation to do it. I think we've accepted that at this table. Um, but whether we have to do them all at once um, because somebody else is asking them for it uh, is is an issue to address. I mean, the uh, you know the Allendale um, West extension and the Wildcat Trail extension are 15, 20 years old, something like that. Um, many of our other streets in Colwood are even older. Um, should we prioritize those over other streets? Can you? Is it is it definitive? Are you sure what it says? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question through the chair. I won't go into into details of it in terms of reading out the text, um, but you are correct. It says that um, the developers of the lands that we've aff aforementioned with respect to works will never be required, so that's a never ever statement, to do any work or pay for any of the costs incurred with respect to improving the road, developing the standards, I'm itemizing the tools and requirements of the development servicing bylaw. However, that doesn't imply that Colwood needs to step forward today and do them all. We can choose to stage it. The fact that we've done nothing to the land since, since the agreement um, is because there's been no burden on it. In discussing uh, with legal representatives, a delay in regards to servicing or access when the agreement and the covenant has been in place since 2001 could be negatively construed. Let's just leave it at that. Um, however, there is options for 
doing portions of the work, providing that the base services were there and the base requirements to access the lands were met, the agreement would just continue to be not be met and just continue to run with the lands as later obligations. As previously spoken about, every year to not do those works provides a 2% increase in the value and cost of those works over the subsequent years. So, okay, um, this, this sort of gets to my my next uh, my next point here, where we, we really need to examine um, the scope of the work and what's included. And 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 I have I have I guess a fair bit of knowledge of this. This was my my career. I did a lot of similar projects to this. Um, and absolutely, the time spent to fully define a project at the front end is is essential. Um, you know, us engineers, we we just love a defined start here, finish there type of project. And, and there's lots of people, if we give them a road cross section and say we need a road from here to there, can come up with a very competent and complete set of plans and, and get it built. I have to say in my career, not, not all my projects were stunning successes. There's a few perhaps I could have done better on or could have gone better. And in thinking about those, every time it goes back to not really understanding the start point or the end point. So I, I think it's very important that, that the city takes the time to really understand what the project should be, uh, what, what, what the cross-section should be. I mean, I think, you know, you referenced that in the, in the transportation master plan, uh, there's a, there's a cross-section that was approved as part of the transportation master plan. And I certainly wasn't, wasn't there at the time, but uh, I doubt that there was an extensive debate over what the cross sections could and should be and what those implications are. Um, you know, we think, I think we have, uh, we also have cross sections in the development services bylaw, which everybody will ad admit is a, is a pretty ancient document, but, but they are legitimate cross sections. Um, I think the developer has thrown in some thoughts what he'd like to see in the way of cross sections. And I think we want to get to the point where all of us staff, council, developers, uh, come up and say, this is, this is the right cross-section. Um, you, you know, just if we look at the proposed cross-section for veterans and the width of that, and, and if that's the cross-section, do we understand if there's sufficient right-of-way all the way through to, um, to Latoria, for instance, or are there going to be constraints? Uh, I don't think we want on top of the costs we've been looking at for roads, uh, having a bunch of property acquisition costs on top of that. So, so we need to look ahead to that. Um, I, I really think that uh, uh, the, the time spent, and again, it may be another thing where we don't have the resources and we have to go out and hire them to, to help us really define the front end of this thing. Uh, I've, I've mentioned concerns about Wildcat and uh, Allendale West as, you know, Yes, we have an obligation to do them. I think we could probably argue we have an obligation to do every street in the city to some kind of higher standard than most of them have now. Uh, I think I think as a council we have to recognize that uh, the majority of projects that come before us are, are developer driven. Uh, people have a piece of property, acquire a piece of property, uh, come in, want to service it. Um, the city says you must service it to the full standards. They do it. You know, they, they put a warranty on it for a period of time and then they, they go and leave and, and it's the city's responsibility after that. Uh, because this is the city responsibility and the city's always here, we may not have the same um, desire or uh, urgency to complete roads that are exist now to standards that are similar to many other roads in town. So, so that's a question that's got to be addressed. I mean, I have thoughts on it. I'm sure the rest of council does too, but, uh, but it would be useful to have some some thoughts from, from, from staff and some thoughts on the costs, and especially when we hear that uh, we may not be covering this out of uh, development cost charges. I, I think that that needs, to be, uh, that needs to be considered and addressed. And I, and I wonder, I understand that that's a bit of work and it's, it's more than you've done, but, but I firmly believe that, uh, that, that getting it right to start with will save time and money in the long run. So is that something that could be undertaken? Um, by your existing staff, your existing resources, or how, how should that really be addressed? I'm not sure of the question I'm actually answering here. Um, 
I'll paraphrase, and please correct me if, 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 if I'm incorrect. A review of the road cross sections for the city of Colwood as they form part of the transportation master plan, I completely concur. Um, should be updated in reference standards. I believe that there's an intention through council to create a committee that will help review those cross sections and standards. In specific regard to the Allendale Works, the developer, the owner of the land, and the owner of the land solicitor, and the city have worked through an extensive exercise between identifying the difference between differences between the 2001 agreement standards that are contemplated in the development servicing bylaw to the standards relevant to the transportation master plan as elected by council. Those standards have been itemized in terms of what was the minimum road surfaces and what are the requirements under each. And in this instance, the developer has agreed to pay for what I've termed correctly or incorrectly as the value added components, which would be the center islands and medians and that sort of stuff. It means that the percentage of works breaks down between the city and the Omicron. As the developers come forward and offered that opportunity for the city to beautify its streets to meet the intent of the transportation master plan, you're very correct. Council does not have to accept that offer, in which case the value of works would probably be decreased. There is certainly time, and there's always time, to allow committee and any council to review any component of the street or any road sort of cross section that they would like to provide. The servicing objectives here, the ability to meet the service and provide access to the lands is what's at minimum to be questioned here. And council in 2001 elected to enable the agreement to go forward under the provision that they would serve and provide access to the, la to the lands. That's two lanes of asphalt on Allendale. Whether they're pushed aside to make way for a center island or not does not negate the fact that it's two lanes of asphalt. It's also the full scope and scale of what would be necessary to serve drainage in terms of the catchment boundaries, which isn't defined by the boundaries that are shown on this map. Sanitary can also be estimated in regards to not only the catchment boundaries for sanitary, but the extension possibilities, because the city has been operating a list station on these lands for X years, run by diesel generator. I think the only portions of the exercise that are in question might be the load potential under BC Hydro, which I am certainly not an authority figure on, nor, nor am I in regards to terracing or servicing the lands by gas. Those decisions will be worked for directly with the developer, to, but it would be intended to be the minimum extent of the land. So if the question is, is, is there value in working through the Colwood Road infrastructure, it would be a value well received by staff so we could update our bylaw and bring it forward. If the question's re relevant to the standards that were imposed in 2001, I wasn't here either. My first year was 2017, and I can tell you the, from the information that I've learned in so far. So that, my inclusion of the city was after 2014, so I also can't speak to the decisions of those days. And that's why I would value an exercise that updated all of those. What I think that the question came down to was the timing and effect of staff. And the more time that is lost will potentially delay the ability to have a service installed, correct or incorrect, for the time of opening of this door. And that's why the question is before committee for council's consideration. And I guess uh, I don't. I don't necessarily think that we have to update all the road cross sections. I understand we're we're in a sort of a jam here. We have a whole bunch of issues that should be addressed uh, for the long term, and will take some time. And we have some issues that are in our face right now, and we should try to deal with expeditiously. So. Uh, I'm not convinced that updating all the road standards is necessary to make the right decision on this project. Uh, I do think that there are a number of road standards that could be considered and, uh, and, 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 and thought about um, and decided which one was appropriate. Um, so, I, and I do, think it I do think it would be uh, relevant because, I, I, as I stated, if we start flying at this project without knowing exactly where we're going, we're going to run into problems, and there's going to be delays and additional costs. So, um, 
you know, uh, perhaps call it a pre-design or some such thing uh, with those decisions um, would be valuable. And I guess my question to you is, is you know, how does that come about? Uh, I, I don't think you have the people in your office to do it right now. Uh, I don't know if you have budget capability to hire somebody to at least start pre-designing. Um, so uh, rather than rather than looking at a choice of, gee, either we uh, build four million dollars worth of works right away and charge right at them, uh, why don't, what I guess I would like to say is why don't we really analyze what exactly needs and should be built and then could fly at that when we, when we got there. What I'm hearing is then a specific intent for Wildcat Allendale, which could certainly be resolved with this committee for council consideration as the first focus of a subcommittee if you wanted to. Uh, this this city does not have drafting and design services in-house, as, as does not many municipalities actually, having better efficiencies of scale going outside. And if this committee wished to recommend an early budget consideration to enable that exercise to go forward, we would certainly undertake it as quickly as possible. Do you think it would be valuable? In regards to the serviceability of the land to deal with the traffic, uh, we already have a traffic study which is, is, is well reflecting of the whole scope and scale of South Colwood. That has been specifically attributed to just this development in certain sort of the zoning turn radiuses that will be applicable to it and the likely densities that may be required on the lands. I always think that extra information will be beneficial. I'm going to just interject just, just to get the CEO to make a comment please. Thank you, Councillor Kobayashi. Um, the first part of the motion that staff are recommending to you uh, this evening is that the Committee of the Whole recommend to Council, uh, and I'll read from part one, as part of the upcoming budget process to propose a draft budget with funding options to design and construct. And I will stop the sentence there. The sentence goes on. Uh, but certainly part of design is pre-design. Uh, staff have clear direction from Council uh, with respect to the transportation master plan that those are the cross sections that we need to use to begin the conversation. But if Council is desirous uh, and you, through the budget process, approve uh, that motion eventually, um, we could return to Council at points of that design for your further consideration. But what we're seeking from you this evening, amongst other things, is uh, permission to come back to council um, and then that council to recommend as part of the budget process that we design these things. Part of design is clearly pre-design. Thank you. Um, and if I could just finish off, you uh, timing of the works you said mid-2021, is that when everything should be constructed by? What assurances do we have of that? I mean, so that's the right time, I guess, is my question. Has estimated, yes. I'd, I'd be better formed to answer that if I had development permits in my hand and then could work through a, a timeline to build. But mid-2021 20, mid 20, is what the target has been expressed to me. Yeah. Oh, I'm up. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Brent. Uh, just a couple of questions to clear up some understanding for me. Uh, you know, I'm reading the recommendation. Uh, it talks about... Uh, Help me understand this. This is uh, through to from Souk up to Cairndale Road. Is that right? I mean, it, it talks about. Uh, I mean, uh, the work from Allendale up to Cairndale. Is that going to be just the servicing? Or are we talking about twinning it or the whole? The actual exercise extends from Souk Road to that southern limit of the land. Going to Cairndale is a benefit of providing a design for relevant works. Um, there was a question earlier on about the cross section on Souk Road. It is it is of appropriate width to accommodate the cross section as shown, um, and it's being base coursed out. So the elected procedure to move forward to Cairndale would have to come back to council. It's not part of the agreement and the minimum obligations to serve the lands. Okay, gotcha. And um, I mean, just a comment. Uh, we inherited this obligation from a previous council, uh, and, and I know that we've discussed legal opinions, uh, but um, this community entered into a legal arrangement with uh, other parties, and uh, I think that uh, 
it behooves us to interpret that correctly, come to an agreement, and uh, move forward to, towards satisfying that obligation. I mean, I, I get there's the how and the when, and whether it's today, tomorrow, or next month, and how we pay for it, there's lots to discuss. But I do believe that uh, this is what makes it different from all the other roads in the community. We're bound by a legal arrangement. Uh, um, my good friend, Councillor Logan, signed off on it. Uh, back in 2001 and we live with that and I, I think that uh, you know we, we, we should ensure that we're to the letter of the contract and I know there's been lots of discussion so having said that um, you know it you satisfied my understanding of that um, but the part that uh, I see uh, there's not, not so much wiggle room but there's some room to do this in stages it would concern me if we sent this out to tender, we spent the four and a half million total between all the parties and it was a beautiful, nice new roadway. And then we have 10 ton cement trucks driving over the new, newly completed roadway, uh, you know, during the construction process. So I do believe there is a discussion as far as timeline goes. Obviously the servicing needs to go into the ground before we get started. And uh, you know, and then the rest can come in, in 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 phases. So, and I don't know if there's a benefit to doing it piecemeal like that, or if there's a benefit just to putting it out, getting it done, or or what. We'll have to rely on uh, smarter people than I that work in this business. Uh, your your comment on my comment, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. Before any surfacing of the road that goes in, it's got to be the underground infrastructure. And as I've explained for, uh, with Councillor Parkinson's questions, some of those underground infrastructures are based on catchment boundaries which are unlikely to change the development of the lands. So that underground component, I think, needs to go in full bore because it needs to be ready to serve the lands. In regards to the minimum road standard, I think that's where Council does have options. The bylaw of 2001 relevant to the transportation and master plan is different. Mm -hmm. um, and Veterans Memorial Parkway will serve these lands. It presently serves these lands. The portion that needs to be added to is the service off of Allendale. Creating a shovel ready project and a project ready that serves the land infinitum for the next 20 years is how the scope and scale is being presented to you. And there is opportunities to just do minimum laning and add on to that in the future. Those minimums, as you pointed out, Councillor Jensen, should not include the minimum underground portions because they're underground. But it could be played with in terms of the standard of the roadway in, on top of it. And yes, maybe subject to multiple budget years. You lose a little bit of efficiencies of scale or economies of, of mobilization and demobilization, probably about a 10 or 15 percent surcharge per added activity. Um, but other than that, you could phase the improvements in regards to lanes, curbs, center medians, lighting even. Uh, thanks, uh, Brent. Uh, I appreciate that. And it gives us whether it's us or subsequent councils, time to think about the uh, you know fit and finish and uh, how they would like to see the bike lanes and accessibility and trails and all that stuff. So I appreciate that. Uh, um, Class D estimate, help me out. Thirty percent is that right? Class D estimate, thirty percent, give or take, is that right? In this case, with the Class D, it came in with a 35% contingency. We actually ran four additional estimates, staff-generated estimates, to include additional work, such as Central Islands, landscaping, portions of Wildcat, to ensure that the estimate was wholly inclusive. I felt that there were some gaps in it. All of the staff estimates came out within 10% of this number, but not reflecting the 35% contingency. Yes, the Class D estimate was what we presented to you folks tonight, and yes, it does have a 35% contingency. Uh, thanks, Brent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Earl, for um, kind of uh, recapping uh, the purpose of the, the recommendation from staff and uh, simply to move this on to the budget process. So notwithstanding the discussion, I, I appreciate that uh, kind of refocus. Um, I, and I will say that, yes, uh, I was the acting mayor back in 2001, and I did sign that agreement, and there's very good reason why that agreement occurred, and uh, without, without that agreement, um, the Veterans Memorial Parkway would not have been constructed um, at that time, and I'm, I'd hazard a guess it would not have been constructed uh, today, as certainly not at the cost that, uh, that it was constructed at. 
Uh, but I, I just want to make sure that uh, we don't lose the fact that just by the very discussion here, this is a good news story. It's a good news story because we have uh, uh, a company that bought a few parcels of property in an undeveloped pit that's ripe for development. Great news story. Um, and, and I will say that the VMP was always uh, envisioned to be four-laned. Uh, just by the very nature of its construction, it was built to a four-lane subgrade with that very uh, expectation that it would be constructed to four lanes. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, I guess uh, uh, based on, on, um, on what you said about a development application and construction wanting to, to begin, I'm assuming that we're, uh, a development application is probably imminent relatively quickly, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, Mr. Lachlan, um, when I hear the time frames of 2021, 20, that's just around the corner, really, in, in the development uh, timeline. So I, I would expect the application kind of run parallel with some of the design work, timing, give or take. So perhaps the timing's perfect. Um, and, and as as uh, Councillor uh, Jansen said, we, we do have an obligation, uh, and we do uh, we have uh, a certain cross section that uh, that is expected uh, uh, from the 2014 transportation master plan. And I can tell you that we our standards back in 2001 sucked, frankly, um, and so. Um, our, our expectations in 2014 are light years ahead of, of what was envisioned uh, perhaps in 2001, and that's that's a good thing. Um, and I guess when I when I reflect when we look at staging works, uh, I look at uh, what would our the city's obligations be uh, on a developer? Would we let a developer stage their works? Exactly. Uh, you know, no, and I, I appreciate that. So, you know, maybe this is rhetorical, but I was looking for that reaction too. Because uh, I, you know, I, notwithstanding we are responsible due to agreement to, to build these works, why would the obligation or onus on us be any different than the uh, obligation on a developer who was uh, obligated to, to construct these works? So, um, so I, uh, there, the, for me, I think we need to be held to the same standards and obligation as we would expect others. But also I look at, uh, even if we did uh, um, stage it, I look at uh, what's the benefit to us. We might save a couple of bucks up front, uh, but as you mentioned earlier, the costs increase. So there, there, there will be a risk on the municipality, uh, a cost risk for sure. Um, and then I look at the, um, the impact on uh, on the community uh, and the disruption uh, to the community and to and to the uh, traveling public, when we go in and construct each kind of stage, um, and it does nothing but build a little bit of anger. It's just like digging up a newly paved road to put in a pipe that we should have thought about uh, five months ago, type of deal. That pisses people off. You know, to be to be blunt, and and uh, so I can see the same scenario here. So I I do recognize and I appreciate that um, uh, we should be doing the design, and and frankly, I think we should be designing if we don't build it, but design up to Carindale, because we know that uh, anybody that drives that section from Souk Road to Carindale uh, on a school day or a work day, it's busy, and uh, the pedestrian movements are increasing. So that section of roadway will need to be upgraded one way or another, it's probably sooner than, than later, and having the design plans in hand um, is helpful. And, and as you say, if, uh, if there's some efficiency that is brought to bear as a result of doing it at the same time as the rest of the upgrades, then I think that makes good economic sense, personally. Um, so I... I I will be, um, and I'm, I'm happy to make the recommendation um, when you're ready for it, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, that we do send this and get the planning rolling, uh, get the plan rolling, so we can actually do some design work and and start thinking about uh, how we're going to pay for this, and uh, and then encourage uh, the developer to uh, get moving with the development application. Thank you. Um,
Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to say uh, repeat uh, what's already been said, and I think Councillor Logan uh, said a lot of what I, I wish to say. Um, first of all, I think this is fantastic news. We have industrial lands that have set empty forever, and we now have an opportunity to actually have something built there and to actually start seeing revenue coming from those lands to the municipality, and I think that's a huge plus. Do I wish um, that this was done in the traditional way? Absolutely. I, I wish the land was expropriated. I wish that the costs were borne in 2001 rather than being forced uh, for us to now realize the cost. But it's, it, it, the same feeling comes for me when we talk about spreading these costs down the road. It's, I don't think it's fair to burden a future council uh, as well to, um, to have to, to pick this up. I also feel we've heard very clearly we're going to see an escalation in costs for construction. We're going to see an escalation in costs of somewhere between two to three to four percent a year if, if we decide to, to put this off. And I think it's also important. I think it's important for um, our community in general. And I'll use an example. The Holiday Inn. The Holiday Inn lands. Um, I was part of this council when we did the first, uh, when that was developed. Those lands presently create about $100,000 a year in property tax. Um, revenue that's coming back to the city. If we choose not to develop these lands or we tr decide to frustrate the development of these lands, that's revenue that we're walking away from as well. And that's revenue that's eventually got to come back to the city. Um, and so I'm very supportive of it. As well, I appreciate the council has spoken this evening about um, um, some technical concerns regarding uh, cross sections and so on. But when, when we go back to, back to the motion, I think the motion is very clear um, that this is just asking to propose a draft budget with funding options for, to design and construct. So this is an opportunity for council to, to see, to hear. I think staff have heard this evening where there's concerns and issues. Hopefully they bring back those options as well to us and that uh, we move this, continue to move this forward. I would also be seconding the motion once Councillor Logan uh, makes it. Thank you. Um, sorry, just a couple of things that occurred to me uh, that I had forgotten to mention. Uh, the first one is just about the phasing, and one of uh, I'm not proposing that we're not building what's what's sensible to build. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, we might want to be informed by what the uses are before we completely commit to. Uh, what our plan is. Uh, the other, uh, the places where I've seen this done successfully has been in some developments uh, in neighboring municipalities where, for example, they have uh, not done the final lift of asphalt until after everything is complete. So you don't end up with those problems of big trucks going over freshly built roadways, um, etc. The other thing that I wanted to remember to mention uh, was to ask about uh, stormwater management. We have a number of homes in Colwood that have been flooding regularly for longer than this agreement has been in place. Uh, part of the problem has been finding a location and I believe we did do the stormwater management plan or is that still in the works? I can't quite remember if it's done or still coming. Um, sir, this portion of the stormwater um, management plan has been submitted by McElhaney. It's been done. Excellent. Uh, because I'm I'm hopeful that along with meeting our obligations to this developer, we are also going to be meeting obligations to other members of our community, including hopefully eliminating uh, future flooding issues. Thank you for raising the the flooding concerns. That's that's. There's two common names that are applied to these lands: Allendale Pit and Patterson Pit. Um, Patterson Pit is where the large portion of flooding actually happens, which is located south contextually than the lands that are in question, but form part of the same catchment consideration of these lands catching that water and giving it a viable route would be part of it. However, the scope and scale of the design and preliminary works that we can do on these lands are only subjected to the proponent's purchase of the lands. It will be 
considered in relation to the, that whole boundary. However, it won't drive a pipe up there at the present time, for example. Phased. That one has to be phased. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Parkinson. Uh, thank you. And then perhaps um, a question most suited for the CAO. Um, I, I hear uh, my colleagues, Councillor Logan and, and Mayor Martin, uh, quite enthused about this and taking the high road and let's do all the work now and, and good on them. Uh, I must, uh, I must uh, confess a little trepidation to our budget for next year. We certainly are looking at things like uh, the, the dam project. Uh, we have uh, discussions last week of, uh, of a roundabout at uh, Veterans of Latoria that's going to have some costs. Will there be a time during the budget process where we have all these items at once and can look at, because perhaps my colleagues might change their mind on phasing at, at that point when they see what the overall budget may be. Will all of this come to us at one point where we can have a rational budget discussion over which are the capital works that uh, we wish to and can afford to undertake? Yes and no. <laughs> I think um, as part of the upcoming uh, budget process council will look at this project and components of this project that are optional and compare and contrast those uh, spending opportunities against other opportunities uh, that said uh, in council's draft strategic plan you have a number of uh, master planning initiatives that are slated to occur in 2020 and 2021 it's my expectation that each of those processes will likely um, result in a series of capital projects that council will have varying desires uh, to move forward on. So it's my expectation that you'll have an opportunity in the upcoming budget process to consider this project against others, but other projects uh, will manifest over the next couple of years that will further compete with projects such as this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move the uh, recommendation. I just you wonder, can still speak. I want to speak before you guys. <laughs> so just uh, just uh, three points here I want to make, uh, Brent. Uh, first of all, I am so super confused about the DCC program on this right now. So super confused. So in the reports back, and we ensure it's clearly delineated what's going to be included in the DCC really want to know that because I'm confused. Right, so that's the first point. Uh, second one is, um, I guess it's sort of related to what everybody's been saying here, but you know me, me and Mr. Resources, why, why projects fail is because we don't, not only don't adequately capitalize them, we don't put, have the resources. And I know you guys are stretched to the limit. Like, can we actually take this on? With, you know, with current resources, or are we going to see an uplift at budget for to, to look after this? I mean, it's a real concern because, you know, we can have all these pie in the sky projects here, but if we can't accomplish them, we're just going to frustrate everyone. So that's that's my second question. And uh, third one, and it's actually posed to the director of finance, and I give her a bit of a heads up here. I, I think a little bit differently. So I have this capital and I want to employ it right now, but I don't know what this return on capital employed is. And why this is important to me personally is that how the heck do you expect me to make a decision on, on land use there when I have no idea what the expected revenue generation that this potentially could to have. You know, like there's got to be some model that someone can slap together and sort of say, this is what the taxation dollars you know, might be. On, on the good side, what's most likely, and on the low side. So it, it actually helps us, um, you know, make decisions on how we want to finance it, what, you know, the road standards that we may use, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, just the uses, what we want, how we want to use it. So m m that was my question. It, it's really, it's, because we all talk about cost, 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 but we never talk about the revenue generation side of it. And to me, uh, as, as a business guy, I, I'm always saying, what's, what's my return on investment on this? I, I know it's hard to measure. It's a, it's a lot diff more difficult in, in the city, but you know, surely we must be able to come up with some educated, wild-ass guess of what that revenue generation is going to be. 
So it does. It would really well make it, you know, affects the way I will decide. So that's my third question. Thank you for those questions, Your Worship, or Your Chair. Um, maybe we'll address them in order of the questions, and I'll defer over to um, our Director of Finance at, at question three. That's all right. As regards to the DCC program, I completely concur. There's been a lot tossed at it in terms of those words and those statements. Um, I would love to say that the DCC program has a foundational backbone that's, that is well representative of the projects of today, but that's not true. It hasn't been updated in, in um, 10 plus years. So the DCC program needs to do a wholesome update through the two representation. And the only reason for tying in the January 13th meeting as part of the presentation tonight is the building block of what we've presented already in regards to what the DCC program should contain, which was contained as part of that resolu resolution and add this building block to that layer. That was the intention of the DCCs, but I completely agree. Um, at some point, those DCCs will have too many projects in it, bringing forward a two costs that may be unpalatable to council to levy onto the developer. And that's a reasonable question to bring forward. And once I start working through the program, I have to bring back a list to council to consider the order and priority, and as, as well as the theoretical placement in my head and translate it through the January 13th meeting, uh, we proposed in rough pattern, three successive updates of the DCC program at five-year increments based on the build type and timeline. So there is the short-term five-year DCC program that I would consider the intersectional Latoria Veterans Memorial Parkway to be in. Would also love for this to be in it, and I'd love to tell you that it's already in it now. Being that it's not in it, and being is that, that I feel that there's a bit of a timing crunch, to not go into your second question yet, but I'll, I'll table up to it. But because there's a bit of a timing crunch, uh, there's a truth that I don't believe that money that we spend before inclusion of DCC program can be contained within it. So we may be able to be capped up to it, but that's why in the financial sections of this report, there's actually two items. I think that what you're focusing in on is that item one of the consideration was the DCC and item two was the potential borrowing through later discussions after the writing and penning of this report, because it happens last week and then this is a new week, um, we have continuing discussions. And it may be that I would want to flip those around to do the borrowing option first and the DCC option based on the timeline of considerations, but I completely understand. Um, so translate from the January 13th meeting into a 5, 10, 15 year program and apply this consideration if enabled into the five-year consideration of that program. So we don't overreach at the beginning of it. Question two is in regards to staffing. Um, I'm gonna speak of the staffing in relevant terms to what I've, what I've undertaken to manage and supervise in terms of the city. There hasn't been a staffing increase in regards to the service levels in the planning services department, development services now it's called today, or engineering um, for multiple years. I can speak to the last two that I've been here and said that there's been no increase in personages to those, to those two departments. It is true that we will struggle and I'll probably have to come back and look at amending our purchasing policy so that we can look at working in a better concert with the developer so I can start having discussions about funding models. To do an in-house exercise of this would be virtually impossible. To do, to do a supervisory in-house exercise of this is highly plausible. So I need to shelve out portions of those works and that may affect our existing purchasing policy. I'm gonna review that with our purchaser and then bring back as part of the discussions for, for future on. Jen, can I refer item three to you, please? Certainly, so in terms of how we fund this and <clears throat> what um, aspects we look at in terms of the ongoing, the use of the property certainly would need to be considered. That in turn will drive, you know, what taxation revenues we will see down the road. And from that, you know, that funding may be looked at to assist with the, the initial outlay right now, um, but also how to sustain this service. You know, we're looking at a number of um, improvements um, and underground service works that are required right now. So to the best that we can upfront, um, 
we would love to do a wholesome analysis. It, part of it depends on you know what the projected use of the lands will be. We also need to keep in mind what we are obligated to do and what funding we have available to us right now today um, in order to get those obligations underway um, and to finance those obligations today. And as we look at um, what our optional works are, um, some of that latter analysis would be more beneficial. Um, but it's important to keep in mind what our obligations are and what specific funding options we have. And we will be highlighting those and making recommendations as part of um, the budget process. And that is when you will see these capital works in conjunction with all of the other proposed capital works under our next um, five-year financial plan. At this time, I'll ask for a motion. Move the recommendations. Yeah. Second. Or, second by the mayor. Any other discussion? Thank you. Um, I just uh, I don't I don't want to be super negative, but I really feel that we do need to put the emphasis on getting our development cost charge bylaw straightened out. Uh, and the reason I say that is that when we developed uh, Whale Road and the hotel went in, the city of Collard was on the hook for about $300,000 worth of frontage improvements and road improvements that we were not able to recover from the hotel. I mean, it's great. They are now contributing back uh, into the community. But at the time, the timing was a major issue and it did cost us to not have um, uh, had that DCC bylaw right up to date uh, and, and to do works in advance uh, of it being contemplated. So, um, you know, I, I am very concerned about the position that the city is putting itself in uh, going forward. I recognize that we have an obligation. I want to be honorable and meet that obligation, but I also want to do it in a, in a smart way so that we can recover um, the costs to the taxpayers and not end up um, having to spend every resource that we have just in order to have roads and nothing else. Do you wish to um, amend the motion then at, at all, uh, Councillor Dave? CEO. Your Worship, administration can commit uh, to return at the next committee of the whole meeting with a specific timeline as to when this council will see uh, proposed amendments to the DCC bylaw. I'm great with that. Uh, seeing no other comments, I'll, I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Councillor Day opposed. And uh, we move on to item six, uh, final public participation. Uh, I'd like to, at this point in time, offer a final opportunity for the public to comment on tonight's agenda items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jim Harcher, and I live at 2789 Guyton Way. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but uh, you are on my subject, DCCs. And so I am so interested in this conversation and the report, which I've taken some time to read. Uh, first of all, um, I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And you, you might remember when I was talking uh, at the, main, the night that uh, I was quoted that I was using this. And I go back and will say to you clearly, development happens uh, when residential and commercial work in concert. Retail, residential, retail, residential, retail, residential. I thought it was a pretty good example of what happens. Unfortunately, the, the, and I appreciate Mr. Engler's comments, the comment about Belmont is very unfortunate because 
it, whilst it's close and it's and it's a kind of an interesting comparison, uh, the reality is that it was uh, next to a plus 500,000 square foot shopping centre. It used to be the third in Victoria. It's now the fourth largest in Victoria. And the infrastructure that's going there is about 140,000 and 25,000 feet of retail. And the owner of that property, Sobeys, they're doing 55 or 60,000 feet, like well over half of that site. So the rest of the housing is not even a quarter. Well, it's maybe about a third built. So the reality is it's an expansion. Where development happens, and there's one engineer and one out here tonight who know this very well, development happens when infrastructure is approved and in place or agreed to be paid for. No infrastructure, no development. That's just the reality of what it is. And uh, the councillor used the example tonight of starting or not knowing where you're starting and not knowing where you're going. Guaranteed results are bad. But if you have infrastructure in place, like the CRD sewer line that came into place, when that was in place, development happened in the West Shore. So it doesn't happen unless it's there or agreed to be there. And that's why I want to talk about the DCCs. There's a number of things that are being said tonight about what was done in 2001 and what wasn't done and whether or not it should be, in, it should be um, I guess the word, um, phased. So the phasing and the, the examples that your development manager brought tonight, 2 to 3% increase. I would say with respect that's very low. And if you add phasing, Mr. Engineer, add 25 to 35 on top of that percent. Because when you, when you do things like that, mobilize and not, and not mobilize again, second lifts of paving is minor, but doing those type of works in phasing is a dramatic increase in cost. And the last thing I'd like to say, because I think it's really important about DCCs, um, and Mr. English's point is a really good one. If his group or himself didn't understand that the, the, the terms of reference for the DCC program and the infrastructure picking up your plan of 2014 didn't include all the retail, well, that would be a disaster. But it does. It, it totally does. We have, you have two um, of the most respected, in my opinion, uh, transportation uh, uh, committee uh, co companies giving you advice on this, Watt and Bunt. Uh, to, to my knowledge, the only really, really well-recognized ones in the province. And both of them have taken and combined their, re their reports for Royal Bay and Royal Beach, for instance, and, and given the results to your, account, to your staff. But it does tie in perfectly with what we proposed from, from Veterans Memorial from Souk South. Makes total sense to tie those together. We agree with that report, report and it picks up this whole discussion, discussion tonight. The last thing I'd like to say, and I, I've heard comments about whether you go proceed now or borrow money or you phase it. Uh, in the DCC program, it's something that your local government hacked is very, very clear on. Uh, your CAO and your staff will make a proposal. It'll be taken by this council and taken to the public. It'll be approved. And in that approval, there's a place for this council to deal with. It's called community assist. Community assist. Either you have a development that 1% of it is a community assist, 20%, 50%, what do you choose to do? The committees, that, the, council, the city that lives next to you, their idea is they put 1% up and the development pays for everything. That's a strong recommendation, but, but if you wanted to assist, borrow money or do, particularly on this project, it's just a matter of how much community assist you want to put in into your proposal. And your CAO knows fully well how that works, but I think that's something you should consider. Uh, in this particular project, it's something that you have inherited a contract, as, as Council Logan said, this road, VMP, was never being built if you didn't agree to this. And Col and Colbert and Lankford were in exactly the same boat. They wanted development, they wanted this road, and the infrastructure that was put in place was dramatically expensive. A four-lane right-of-way, all the right-of-ways in place down to Latoria. So what they did is, you know, it's called interim agreement. And the ultimate is now what we're talking about. This happens all the time in development. I'm doing the same thing right now with Bear Mountain Parkway. Interim, the interim was put together. Now the developers, they paid for that also, by the way. Now the ultimate is being built. So to me, the concept of tying what you recommended from your staff tonight makes total sense. And we as developers, and I don't want to use this as part of our application, but we fully understand that development should pay for infrastructure, especially in this case, transportation. And your staff are fully apprised of my commitment to them to say, we want to pay for it. We want the study to be accurate. Two different studies basically combined to say the same thing. It picks up what VMP finishes at Cairndale and goes north to Souk. 
and totally make sense to us. And so I say with respect, Mr. English and your group, we budgeted those, those, inter those um, in increase of, of, of traffic with, with the um, commercial and the residential. It picks up this particular problem, and I say fixes it from a commitment of 2001. And the rest of it is just a matter of how much you want the community to assist in some of the other community events and issues that you might want to uh, fix or do or improve, if that's what you want to do in the rest of the community. The ones we're talking about, and, and I, I discussed this with your staff, whether a local service area might have been more appropriate. I think they've decided the DCC program is more important and, and we, we support that. But I, I really in, I want you to know the development industry that I'm representing always understand development pays. And they pay through DCCs or they pay it in other ways in cash sometimes. And I, I will say one more thing. I've been thinking so much about DCC since you, you as councillor speaking. If you don't put it in place, you can't collect the check. So if the DCC program isn't in place, the developers don't have to pay. And if they do, do pay, it's double jeopardy for them. They do the work, but they can't credit. It isn't fair in my opinion. So I would say with encouragement, help your staff to find the quickest way to get a DCC program that you think works as council. Stand behind it. There's some tremendous consultants who are out there working in the public sector that your staff can work with, engineering firms. And I say, we're all about trying to do it. We're all about trying to do it right. And we pick up Mr. English and other people's comments. Make sure you include all the work that you're proposing. And it won't be done overnight. <clears throat> Excuse me. It'll take 25 or 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it takes. But have it in a stage that you do 100% each time as the development matures. And your staff are fully aware of what are the two particular corners that are already failing, or are not failing particularly, but not well serviced in, at Latoria, at both Machosen and at Veterans Memorial, and start growing from there. Thank you for your chance to let me speak. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Hartshaw. Any other comments? Uh, good evening. I'm Warren Brown from uh, 3529 Proudfoot. Um, I wanted to speak to the uh, the uh, issues and the, the comments that we're on tonight. Um, there's an old saying that revenue serves, sell, solves a lot of problems, and so I'm quite supportive of the industrial and commercial um, work. Um, so it, it's going to be a very positive, uh, I think, addition. The Allen Lands will be a very positive addition to uh, the tax base of, of uh, Call it. Um, I took a look at the finances of the uh, of the organization, and they're they're presented in a little different way than I'm used to seeing. So I may have these numbers wrong. Um, but one of the things that was raised here tonight was the issue of borrowing money to actually go ahead with this uh, project. And uh, it seems to me you have about 10 million of outstanding debt right now, and this would add another 4 million in debt. That's about a 40 percent increase in debt. Uh, which would take you up to about 50% 50, 50 of GDP. And that's fairly high in, in my mind. So, uh, I know other governments are quite happy to have it that high, but uh, it's a consideration that you might want to look at. I, I also know you have some investments as well, uh, so they offset uh, the, some of the debt that's out there. And, uh, and I'm good on you. I see you've, you've changed them over so that they're actually earning a lot more than, uh, than they were in the past. Um, there was another comment that came up around the return on investment, and I think that's really important as a part of the consideration for this project, is that you have um, at least a um, best case, worst case scenario on what the revenues are going to be produced out of this thing. So that means you need to know kind of what's going to be here. Now, in a municipal tax base, you can, that can be pretty fluid in, in, in my mind. Uh, but I would say that that would be one of the things that we should look for when the recommendations come back from staff is what's the revenue generation of this thing over the next five to seven years at a minimum. Thank you. Thanks very much. Motion to adjourn. Oh, who's, who's making the motion to adjourn? Oh, I did. Oh, okay. The mayor did. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, all in favor? <laughs> I haven't seen anyone say no. <laughs> no. <laughs>